Hey, it's um, time again for another BDC podcast. I'm Pastor Eric Johns, pastor of the Buffalo Dream Center, and I am with uh, Pastor John Tash from Tash Ministries International, and uh, we've just been having a great time over these uh, podcasts, just hearing stories about uh, his life and about what God, how God led him to where he is today, uh, primarily reaching children with the gospel and seeing children and young people used by God. It's just been exciting. If you haven't listened to the previous two uh, in this series, make sure that you do that because uh, this is part three and we want to dive right into it today uh, because, um, Pastor John, we've talked about a lot of things up until now and I think we've been leaving people hanging uh, for the past couple weeks. On um, uh, You started to bring kids, kids, not just teenagers, but uh, kids onto the mission field. And uh, when I, we first met 22 years ago, I had never heard of anybody doing that. I'd heard of um, uh, Teen World Outreach and uh, Teen Mania mm-hmm. and uh, some of these ministries that were bringing teenagers onto the uh, mission field. Actually, actually, my first mission trip was with one of those organizations as a, a teenager. I went to Scotland for seven weeks and um, uh, preached the gospel. But you were, you and your wife were taking kids and not only taking them, but equipping them to do the work of the ministry yes. and seeing them used by God. Uh, because as you stated in the last podcast, they're not the church of tomorrow, they're the church of today. And you, you so uh, you've got to have some awesome stories and about just what these kids did when they went with you onto the mission field oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. some things that you want to share with us about that. I'll never <laughs> forget the mother that came up to me and she says, Pastor John, I can't understand. You take children. We've taken over 6,000 children, ages 7, 8, 9, 10, uh-huh. and teenagers all over the world on missions, 28 different countries. Mm-hmm. And I'll never forget this mom. She comes up to me. She says, how in the world do you take kids all over the world <laughs> on missions? To- I can't even take my boys to Walmart. <laughs> they drive me up the wall, you know. But I've got no greater joy. And what we do... Uh, Pastor Eric, what we do, we take them to through the training steps. Okay. Now, so they don't just get on the airplane and go with you. you oh you, no, 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 you're, no. You're training them. We're training okay. them. We we make sure months in advance they're reading their Bible, they're praying, they're going to church. Hello, going to church mm-hmm. every week. They don't have to be told to read their Bible to worship God. I mean, they're there. Mm-hmm. You can tell and you can see spiritual growth on the inside of that Mm -hmm. seven, eight-year-old. And then we train them. We train them how to do the work of the ministry. You say, how do I train my child in the things of the Spirit? Very easy. The way you train your child how to make the bed is the same way you train them how to cast out a devil. Really? The same way you train them how to take out the garbage is the same way you train them how to lay hands on a sick person and pray God's healing power to flow into that, that sick body. You know, a lot of times we, we put a wall or divide the practical things of life, taking out the garbage and making the bed and folding your clothes, and over here it's the spiritual things, you know? No, the same way you train your child how to make the bed, take out the garbage and set the table for, for dinner is the same way you train them how to lay hands on the sick, cast out devils, and pray the prayer of faith. Mm. Training step number one, I do, you watch. Son, I'm going to show you, I'm going to train you how to make the bed, to fold up your clothes, to take out the garbage. Son, I need you to watch me. I do. Training step number one is I'm going to do it, and you watch me. You're going to watch me today make the bed, take out the garbage. You're going to watch me today, son, how to pray for a sick person. Training step number two is, I do, now you help. Okay. Son, yesterday you saw daddy make the bed and fold up your clothes and take out the garbage, and you watched daddy do it. Son, today I'm still going to do it, but you're going to help daddy. So you saw me when I laid my hands on that sick person. Today, son, you're going to help me. So training step number one is, I do, you watch. Training step number two is, I do, you help, 
Training step number three is now you're going to do it and I'm going to help you. Mm. See, you watch daddy make the bed the first time. Then you help daddy make the bed the second time. This time you're going to make the the bed, but I'm going to be there to help you, son. Mm. The same with laying hands on a sick person. You watched you watch me pray for that person. Training step number two, you help me mm. pray for that sick person. Training step number three, now you're going to pray for that, that person, but I'm going to be there. Yeah. I'm going to be there to help you. Training step number four is now you do, I watch, which fulfills 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. There's four generations found in that one verse where the Apostle Paul is speaking to his spiritual son. And the things that you have seen me do, now you do in part. Four generations, the I do, you watch. I do, now you help. So we take every single one of those children and teenagers and adults, take them through those training steps here, even the missions team that we have here in the inner city of Buffalo this week helping you, mm -hmm. we're taking the same ones. We've got an eight-year-old. His name is Sawyer from New Hampshire. He started coming when he was six years old. This is now his fifth missions trip Wow! to Buffalo, mm -hmm. okay? And we're taking him through those training steps. His sister gave morning devotions this morning. I mean, that's where it all starts. Yeah. Now, you talk about miracles. Can I share some of the miracles? We want to hear them, yeah. <laughs> I'll never forget. I'll never forget going into Mexico, in the central part of Mexico. And there was a lady that came in um, under one of our tents. She had a tumor the size of a grapefruit. Mm. One of my 11-year-old boys by the name of Jason began to pray for that lady. And after two minutes, the only thing that was left was dangling skin, wow. an 11-year-old praying God's healing power. I'll never forget the mm. first time we went to Durban, South Africa. Durban, South Africa is right along the Indian Ocean, right along the Indian Ocean, and they set up this 10,000-seat tent, and uh, it was filled every day with thousands and thousands of people. Well, I said to my, one of my young boys, he was nine years old, I said, I want you to be ready to preach tomorrow morning. He said, yes, sir, I'll be ready. Well, he preached for 45 minutes. And how to oh, be... Nine years old. Nine years old. <laughs> and it wasn't a nine-year-old preaching to children. It was a nine-year-old preaching to thousands of adults wow. underneath that tent. Pastor, he preached for 45 minutes. The title of his message was How to Be an Effective Witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> he got finished preaching. He closed up his Bible. He says, I'm done preaching. Now I want to lay my hands on you. Nine years old. Wow. He said, if you want me to lay my hands on you and to prophesy into your life, get on down here. People went, came down by the hundreds, dust flying all over underneath that tent in mm. Durban, South Africa. Wow. Three hours later, guess what that nine-year-old is still doing? Laying hands on the people and prophesying into wow. their lives. Can I tell you another one? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, 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 those are incredible stories. No, I, I got story after story <laughs> after story. I'll never forget. We were in the Apache Indian Reservation Five hours a drive northeast of Phoenix, Arizona. It was hot. The Apache Indian Reservation. They had set up a, a, a huge tent. There, were, there had to be maybe seven, 800 people underneath that tent that night. And I'm preaching. And as I'm preaching, I, I notice in the back of the tent, there was this teenage girl. She would poke her head around the tent pole. She never did come in. Never did come in. After the message, I got finished. I'm done. One of my leaders comes up to me. She comes up on the platform. She says, there's a teenage girl out in the parking lot. We really feel like she's demon-possessed because every time we try to talk to her, a man's voice comes out and foam comes out of her mouth. We really feel like she's demon-possessed. And as you know, I used to work for Dr. Sumrall. <laughs> he taught me how to cast out devils. You weren't afraid of that. <laughs> so I took a beeline down the center of that tent, 
I'm within maybe 10, 15 feet of that teenage girl ready to cast out some devils when the Spirit of God said to me, don't you cast them out. You let the girls do it. Mm. So I turned around, Pastor, I grabbed three of the girls, 10, 11, 12 years old, that were part of the team. I said, girls, there's a teenager in the parking lot there that's filled with devils. Cast them out. Us adults, most adults that I know, oh, I don't do devils. <laughs> I do right. headaches, stomach aches. That's it. <laughs> but those three girls, oh. they backed that teenager up along a pickup truck mm. on that reservation in that parking lot, passed her and she'll, until she was completely delivered. Praise God. Let me tell you another one. Yes. You're going to love it. Little boy, we had four Sunday morning services, four Sunday morning, and we had lots of kids, lots mm. of kids that we were pastors of. And I'll never forget little little eight-year-old boy comes up to me after the service. He had his tie and his suit and his Bible in his hand, cute as a whistle, you know? <laughs> he comes up and he said, Pastor John, God's called me to be an evangelist, just a little guy. <laughs> and I said, Daniel, yes, he has. And I want you to be ready next Sunday to preach. We had a Sunday night service, okay, 350 mm. kids. And I said, I want you to be ready to preach next Sunday night. He said, okay, I'll be ready. I'm excited. Well, little Daniel gets up there the next Sunday night, preaches to 350 children. Finishes preaching. He preached for about 30 minutes. Finishes preaching. We had a four-foot-high platform, similar to what you, maybe even higher than yours. Anyway, he gets up. He gets finished preaching. He goes to the right side of the platform. He said, if you're here tonight... And you don't have Jesus in your heart. Here's a eight years old. You don't have Jesus in your heart. Get down here. He looks out over that group of kids. He says, I'm waiting. Get down here. If you don't have Jesus. He waited for the altars to be filled. He, he walks over to the center of the platform. Planet, center of the, he said, if you're here tonight, you've got Jesus in your heart. But you know your life is not right with God. Get down here. I'm going to get your life right with God tonight. He waited for the altars to be filled. He goes off to the left side of the platform. He said, if you're here tonight and you're not filled with the Holy Ghost and you don't speak in other tongues, I'm going to get you speaking in other tongues tonight. I'm going to get you filled with the Holy Ghost. Get down here. I'm waiting. <laughs> well, Daniel King is not eight years old anymore. He just turned, I believe, 44 or 45 years old, married, has two beautiful children. Pastor, he travels all yep. over the world doing massive healing crusades. He just sent us pictures. I forgot what country he was in. 30, 35, 40,000 people a night. Where did he get his start? Mm. When he was a child. And That's I incredible. gave him a platform, and I said, you can do it. Why? Because God has called you to preach. Wow. These are just some, some of the things, some you know, of the I, miracles. I do think that I, I, a lot of uh, pastors, maybe it's an insecurity, I don't know, but they're not willing to do that. They're not willing to let someone step up and that they see the call of God in it. You know, I, they want to be the one to do it all sometimes, and I think we, are, we need to. Give that platform. Well, you know, one people. of the problems that we have as leaders in our church, we think ministering to children is babysitting. Right. No, let me just say, glorified babysitting. Mm. Uh-uh. We're ministering to the greatest harvest field in the world today. Yeah. People say to me, I I'll never forget the mom. I mean, we had 1,500 children on a Sunday morning. I'll never forget, thank you for taking care of my child. I said, Mom, I don't take care of children. We minister, my wife and I and our, our volunteers here, we minister to children. And she said to me, one of these days, God's going to make you a pastor. <laughs> I wanted to wring her neck. Yeah, yeah. I said, what do you think we're doing? Mm. I mean, we, we are pastoring. We are pastoring 1,500 children. And then we're pastoring 1,500 that we're busing in every Saturday for our Saturday Sunday school. We are their pastors. Yes. Yeah. I say to people, you know what your job description is as a pastor, as a leader? It's Psalm 23. Mm. It's Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. 
my pastor. Yeah. Pastor Eric, when they come here, it's Pastor Eric is my pastor, my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Whenever I'm around Pastor Eric, whenever I'm around Pastor John or Pastor Shirley or, or leaders, what? He restores my soul. Mm. And yea, though I walk, I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death. I don't have to fear no evil. Why? Because I know my shepherd, my pastor is leading me. That's why it's so important. Get yourself in a local church. Yeah. Get involved. Serve. You need a pastor. We yeah. all need shepherds. Yeah, we do. Yeah. You now, it just seems that the call of God on your life and on Shirley was unique, or maybe it shouldn't be unique, but not only were you pastoring children, but you were raising them up and training them to do the work of the ministry, which is what my wife and I, Michelle, Michelle and I, we feel the same. We, um, all our ministry, we've been surrounded by young people, children and young people that we're training. Her staff in Love Honduras is, is um, almost all um, young people mm. that are uh, late teens, early 20s, that uh, feel have a call of God on their life that, that she's training and molding and shaping. And same thing here um, for us here in Buffalo. Um, I'm always, I think it's great. It's good for me to always be around young people. You know, and it keeps oh, you, yeah. it keeps yeah, you yeah, young yeah. and keeps you vibrant. So, um, so I, that, I mean, to me, not a lot of people are doing that. Not there, a lot of ministries die off and end when the person in charge that founded it die, goes to be with the Lord. And then the, where the ministry's not doesn't continue because nobody was trained right. uh, to take over where's the next generation. Yeah, know? and it, I've been to those one-generation churches mm. where they used to run hundreds and hundreds, and now they're dwindling down, down. Why? Well, because they're not reaching that next generation. Yeah. 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 It's and not so, a healthy church. It's not. You know, and that's, I think you can tell a healthy church when you've got, uh, you've got multiple <laughs> generations yes. and young people. And um, we're about to end this podcast, but I, I just want to share with you that um, it, what a major impact you've had on Michelle and I. And it, I, I, the whole time you're talking about these stories, I think about one of our trips to Honduras years ago. And this is before we started our Love Honduras ministry. But we took a team of young people, it was all, uh, teenagers that were on the team and some children, and we had a service. I've never been in anything like this before or since. There were 45 people in the service that were deaf. We had an altar call for the deaf, mm. some in one ear, some in both ears, some deaf their whole life, some had an injury, um, all different reasons, but the church w meeting was about 500 people, so there's a lot of people there, but 45 people walked wow. up to that altar call. and. I never laid hands on a single person. We used all the young people on our team. But I walked down off the stage, and it was with my son Alex. I'll never forget this. I walked down off the stage to help my son pray for this person he was laying hands on. And, and I walked up next to him, and I went to put my hand. And he said, Dad, what, what are you doing? He said, I'm here to help you. It just reminded me of it when you were talking about, you know, um, yeah. you know I'm here, you're helping. They're doing your helping. I said, I'm here to help. And he said, oh, Dad, I don't need you. He's already healed. Like by the time I got, <laughs> by, the, <laughs> by the time I got down off the stage, he was healed. And I've never been in a meeting like that before because at all 45 people were healed. Shoo. Not Praise one person God. didn't Praise get it. God. And it was just an incredible thing. I remember a... a 10-year-old little girl and her big, huge father that was standing behind her. And my first thought was, man, if she doesn't get healed, we're in trouble. This guy is like big, burly, Honduran guy. He was crying like a baby. She had been deaf since birth. Wow. And she was healed. And uh, so it's mm. uh, not only important to go and do the works of Jesus, but to train the next generation yeah. Uh, yeah. to do it so that when we're, we're gone, um, it's still going on. And my prayer as a spiritual father is that they do more than I've ever done. Oh, yeah. You know, and they build greater churches and reach more people. And um, I just tell them all, look, if you get famous, give me some credit. You know, that's all, <laughs> <laughs> that's all I say. <laughs> So, well, thank you so much for watching the podcast again. We're going to do one more with Pastor John Tash, and um, you're not going to want to miss it. That's going to be next week. Uh, thank you for sharing this with your friends, for supporting the Buffalo Dream Center, and also uh, Tash Ministries International. And um, if you've never heard of Pastor John and his wife Shirley before these podcasts, 
then you can look them up as well because they're doing incredible things, as you've heard, uh, for the kingdom of God. Father, I mm. thank you for everyone watching. Thank you for an impartation into our lives today. Uh, hearing the stories of these miracles, Father, I believe, Lord, that you're still the God of miracles and you still want to do things like we've heard about today, that they're not just stories of the past or stories about things that happened in faraway lands, but you want to do those things in America once again and shake this nation for Jesus. Yes. And we thank you, Father, that we can be a part of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.